really, really, really good to see each one of you here. It's great to be here this morning. <clears throat> good morning and welcome to Father's Day. I'd like to thank everyone again who helped and assisted this year with VBS. This congregation continues to come together to assemble a tremendously meaningful and spiritually challenging event. There were so many people involved in Vacation Bible School this year on so many different levels and in a variety of different activities and roles. It means a lot to have so many people contributing to this wonderful event. At one point, we had some people from this neighborhood stop by, thanks to the flyers that the high school students handed out last Sunday afternoon. So congrats in order to the youth for stepping out and inviting people to VBS. And our young people throughout the week invited many of their friends to Vacation Bible School. We had a lot of visitors. It was a really wonderful week. This completes two-thirds of the major youth activities for this year. We had uh, LTC back in April, and that was a wonderful event in Kansas City. We had 13 students from this congregation participate, and then we just finished VBS, and very soon church camps are coming, uh, and those are wonderful, wonderful opportunity for young people to connect with God and connect to people uh, at their age level and develop some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful relationships. Um, so I would encourage as many youth and parents and church members to get involved as possible in some type of, of church camp. You can either volunteer or go. There's so many ways to get involved and participate and, and just make the most out of this summer. The other day, I was getting ready to cook some hamburgers on my grill, and uh, I turned it on and lit it up, and uh, all of a sudden, there was a whole lot more fire in there than I'm used to. <laughs> so, uh, be, unbeknownst to me, a, uh, some type of bird or something had built a nest in the entire thing. The only problem was he didn't tell me. <laughs> if he had told me, I could have moved the desk, but it was too late by the time I got to it. So my, my Father's Day advice today for lighting your grill is check it first. <laughs> Make sure some animal hasn't tried to move in on there and, and uh, take over. <clears throat> One of the things I'd like to talk about this morning is the subject of fathers. The subject of fathers is indeed a profound one and one of the utmost importance. The Bible speaks deeply on the subject of fathers and the role in our lives. The need for godly fathers in our society is reaching profoundly desperate proportions. I would give you statistics, but they're so depressing I can't stand to. <laughs> All I can tell you is this. If you are a godly father, every single man who answers the call to be a godly father is fulfilling a role that is of the utmost urgency. And I hope you know that and I hope you understand that. I hope as you look at your role as a father in a godly way that you see the profound importance of what you're doing. In fact, we find that we are not just fathers to our own families. We find that our impact and our influence reaches deeply into the lives of others in ways that we often will not recognize or comprehend at the time. You know, when we reach out to that neighborhood kid or to that kid at the store or, or that kid anywhere, <laughs> as a Christian, we make an impact, and we make a difference, and we make an importance. And this is why Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In today's message, I would like to spend a few moments in exploring some scriptures that speak to us about how we can be fathers in a manner that brings glory to God and in so doing allows us to find purpose and direction in our lives. Jesus shares with us, with us in Matthew 5, 16 that we are to live lives characterized by good deeds and positive communication that teaches the world about its true self. This verse says that the world will see the good that we do and recognize it as from God. Why? Because it will be beyond the ordinary call of service that they expect and it will reflect a greater love for people than they normally experience. Now Jesus once said, if someone asks you to go one mile, what? Go with them too. <laughs> if somebody, Jesus said, if somebody asks you for a shirt, give them your cloak too. Go beyond. And this is what we do as fathers and as Christians and what God has done for us. He's given us more than we expected. In Psalm 103, verse 13, God says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. As fathers, we are to lead and discipline our children, but in the process, 
Don't miss this. <laughs> we are to make sure they experience compassion. We are to make sure that they know that we love them. Not just that we want them to be something, <laughs> but that we love them deeply. That we tell our children we love them. That they mean a great deal to us and that we will be there for them when they need us. If they know that we want them to be the one to help them, we can have a great deal of hope that they will one day reach out to us in their time of need. You know, I heard one say one time that one of the best things that we can do in life is to work hard at work, work worth doing. Isn't that important? One of the things about fathers and about God is the work that they do, right? When I was a kid, my dad was at work a lot. <laughs> Many, maybe your father was as well. One of the things that we see fathers given in this world is a role that gives them a job and a purpose and work. And one of the best things that we can do is to find a work worth doing. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord and not for men. Recognize that God is our true boss, supervisor. <laughs> that he's truly the one we're working for, maybe not the person that we actually think we are, but that God is. D.L. Moody once came home from a meeting completely exhausted. He'd been working, he'd been preaching and preaching and preaching, and his family said, you're exhausted, you need to rest. <laughs> and he said to them, he said to them, I am weary in the work, but I am not weary of it. And one of the things I think as we look at the work of the church and the work that we do in the gospel, we may at times be tired. We may at times be weary, but we need to push on. We need to continue to go and go and do what God has given us to do. <clears throat> Matthew 6, verse 2. One of the results of our work is we have opportunities to give of the things that we earn. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 2, When you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets to be honored by others. <laughs> Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. One of the things I was thinking about as I was reading this verse, it had the word father in it, so I wanted to use it. <laughs> One of the things about giving, you know, as fathers, we work hard to have the opportunity to give to others, don't we? I work and work and work because I want to be able to give to my kids. I want to be able to give to the church. I want to be able to give, not just to have. <laughs> There's a huge difference there, isn't there? Working to have or working to give. God gives. Our Heavenly Father gives so much. And one of the things that we are learning here is as fathers, we have an obligation to give. As fathers, we have an obligation to give as God gives, not just a little. <laughs> God gives profoundly. God fills our lives with our friends and our jobs and our families and our church all the wonderful things that we have and we've experienced. And we as fathers, we work hard to give this to others. The world says work hard and spend it on yourself. The gospel teaches us to give of ourselves and of our wealth. And I think this is really important. First to God. Give of ourselves first to God. Give of ourselves first to Him. When we do that, we will know that everything else will fall into place, right? <laughs> if we give to God first, everything else will be right. Then to others and finally to ourselves. We give to our children, our spouses, our families, friends, and many, many, many others. The opportunities for us to give and to reach into people's lives are substantial. The opportunities for us to make an impact are many and plentiful. And so we give to our children. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, Paul writes to them, he says, whoever, he says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. As we give into the lives of others, don't just give a little. Sometimes people ask me for a dollar, I give them five. Sometimes people ask me for five, I give them ten. <laughs> you know, I want them to know that I want them to realize that I want to help them more than they want me to help them. I want them to know that I want to help them beyond their expectation. And if we have a concept and a desire to reach into people's lives and help in this way, you know we're going to make a statement. 
People's lives will be touched not with just us. It's about showing them God. It's about showing them their Heavenly Father. And all of this is done in the spirit of humility, meaning that we understand that God has given us whatever we have, and we are to use these things to enhance the lives of others that they might see their Heavenly Father as we do. We see God as a giver, but the world does not. The world does not have this knowledge of God as a benevolent, gracious, loving God who loves and cares for them and sent His Son for them. They don't see God that way. It's our job to show them Him. And so we give and God rewards us for doing so in profound ways. In Matthew 6.6, 6, that same passage of Scripture, Jesus says, When you pray, <laughs> and as fathers we must pray, when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Don't you know what your kids need before they ask you? Most of the time we do, don't we? <laughs> My kids come up to me and they say, man, I, I want some candy. I, I knew they did. Dad, I need a drink. I know you do. <laughs> and I'm happy to provide those things. In fact, I find joy in it. It's a profound opportunity to provide those simple things over and over and over and over again. Our Heavenly Father also takes deep and profound joy in meeting our needs. Deep and profound joy in communicating with us in prayer. And this is why He urges us to go to a secret place and pray to Him just you and us, just Him and you, God and you. Pray in secret that you may have a special and precious relationship with your Heavenly Father. You know, my sons love to catch me one-on-one -on -one and be with me by themselves. Did you know that? Why do they like that? <laughs> Why do they crave that? Why do we crave that relationship with God? Because it shows that we are important. It shows that we have a special place with that person. And when we nurture that relationship, what will happen with it? It will grow and strengthen and become something truly special and wonderful. And this is why we pray. And we connect with God. And as we do that, we learn to connect with others. We learn to connect with our families. And we learn to connect with people around us. When we worship, there are so many things that as fathers that are very important. We need to lead in worship. We need to engage in worship and show ourselves to be actively involved in what is happening. We need to step up when needs arise. They need to be taken care of and handle them to the best of our ability. We need to put worship before our own desires and interests. That's a difficult one sometimes. Now, the worship of God should take preeminent place in our life. If that is true and if that is happening, Everything else about our life will start to fall into place. Everything about our lives will start to work. <clears throat> I was riding in a car one time with a dear Christian brother. He was a mentor to me, wonderful example to me. And this guy had never led a song in his life, <laughs> to my knowledge. Okay, But we are riding in this car, and we're not talking, but he is singing song after song after song out of the hymn book. Worship. Worship, worship, worship. May it be a preeminent part of what we think about and what we are. Not that we're bragging about these things, but that we are using them. That we are making them have a place in our life that is, has purpose and direction. So Malachi 2 verse 10, the Bible declares to us, Do not we all have one Father? Did not one God create us? This is a very, very important theme today, isn't it? To know that there is one Father and one God. Verse 15 says, Has not one God made you? You belong to Him in body and spirit. And what does this one God seek? Godly offspring. Offspring that represents His love and His will. The Bible speaks so much about the fact that God is our Father. This is one of the most celebrated teachings in all of Scripture. That not only do we serve a benevolent God who is just, loving, and kind, but He also has made it so that we are not merely His creation. 
We're not just cows and dogs and trees and fish. <laughs> we are his sons and daughters in the gospel. We are not just a creation. We hold a special place and a special role in this world and in eternity. Not just here in this life where we suffer and we agonize over the things of the world. One day God will free us from all of that. Malachi 3.17, God says, On the day when I act and when I come, God looking far into the future, <laughs> on the day when I come, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. Isn't that what Peter wrote in one of his letters? That they are a people, a treasured possession, a holy priesthood, a people for God's own possession, that they would be special to him. God says, I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. God says, it's coming a time when the people that serve God will be recognized, will be rewarded profoundly more than the world could ever imagine. God says, I will show you a distinction. In the world you live, you may see the wicked prosper for a time, but there will come a time where that will all go away. Even though we are not perfect, God will forgive us. He will show compassion on us and make us his most precious possession. As the old hymn states, how deep the Father's love for us, how blessed beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. I love those words. I think about them all the time. That God would look down upon us and make us his absolute treasure. Profound. One of the great complaints against God is that the righteous suffer and the wicked at times experience prosperity, albeit short-lived. What God is saying to the world here is that, what, you will, what will you say when I create an eternity where the righteous eternally prosper and the wicked eternally suffer. This is the challenge God is leveling to the world. What will you say when I do make things the way you say that they should be? <laughs> what side of eternity will you choose? Is what God is saying here. Because I will make a distinction, God says. And I have already decided and planned and prepared what will happen. So the choice to us is to make a very important choice. Which side will you be on when God eternally creates the reality that people criticize Him for not yet achieving? The Bible teaches us that we will live in a world given over to sin. The effects of this reach each and every one of our lives. But God has also reached out to us and indeed shown compassion on us and will one day eternally save and bless those who have made the Lord Jesus the Lord of their lives. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. <laughs> God so loved it. Not that he so abandoned it, or was so frustrated with it, or was so upset at it, at all the things that were wrong with it. <laughs> the Bible says that in spite of those things, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. These are very, very, very important things to think about. I wrote here that the gospel story is indeed a profound one. Filled with wonder and awe, amazement, sacrifice and love, even though the world was lost. Even though men had chosen to succumb to the evils and temptations of life. God still, instead of judging the world and sweeping away and all the evil of it like he did in the flood, he still loved the world that he had made, still loved those made in his own image. And God refused to allow the world to be eternally lost in judgment. I read that really slow. <laughs> because it took me a long time to phrase that the way I wanted to say it to you this morning. It is so important to realize that God has not abandoned us. Like we don't abandon our kids when they make a mistake, right? <laughs> when, my kid, when my sons make a mistake, I don't, I don't shove them into the room and never go back for them again. That's not the way God treats us. 
It's not the way I treat my kids. I discipline them, but then I go to them. And then I tell them I love them, and then I restore the relationship, and we get back on track. And this is what God has done in His Son. He has given us a way to be with Him and to be right with Him. <clears throat> he still loved the world that He had made, still loved those made in His own image. God refused to allow the world to be lost eternally in judgment, refused to allow the world to think that He did not care <laughs> at all that they had suffered and lost, refused to allow the world to think that He would sit idly by while there are children suffering. God sent His Son. God gave the greatest thing a father can give. He sent His Son not just to explain Himself to us. <laughs> Jesus was not just a prophet. And this is very important. The prophets of the Old Testament came and spoke the will of God. And many times they did it out of love and with great tears and with great suffering. Jesus came equally as a prophet to explain God to us, but more than that, <clears throat> not just to conquer the evil forces of the world. God did not come just to conquer the devil, which he also did. <laughs> All this is profound and remarkable to me. God sent his son to explain him to us, to conquer evil, which the gospel continues to do every day. But he sent his son to die for our sins that we might be forgiven and redeemed from the destruction that is coming upon this world. Conclusion. In the book of Luke, Jesus tells a parable about a lost son who leaves home, squanders his wealth, and finds himself hopelessly lost with no one to help him. No one knows he's there. No one knows what he's going through. No one knows he's in trouble. And in the midst of feeding pigs and himself having nothing to eat, he, as the scripture says, reasons with himself. He remembers who he is. And he makes a very important decision that each of us must make. In Luke 15, 18, he says, I will set out and I will go back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven against you. In Luke 15, 20, he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Today it's my prayer that while we celebrate all the wonderful things that our earthly fathers do in our lives, it is my deep prayer that each of us, like the lost son, will look at our lives realize who we truly are and realize that we are just not that we are not here just to suffer and perish but we are here to find our heavenly father put our trust in him and his son and allow him to bring the healing and love and compassion into our lives that we deeply crave and desire today if we can pray for you if we can be of any service to you and when you come as we stand and sing